Hi, welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy Robbins, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. I'm back today with Rabbi Wendy Geffen, and if you haven't had a chance to listen to our first episode, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that, because there we discuss Judaism, how Judaism explains and understands life and death and spirituality and what happens when we die and the afterlife and all the good juicy stuff that I love to talk about on this podcast. But today we're here back with Rabbi Geffen to hear one of her stories. And I received this email from my mom. Thanks, mom. Shout out. And she sent me a sermon that Rabbi Geffen had given Uh, shortly after Yom Kippur and I was so moved and touched by the story that I wanted to make sure to have an opportunity to share it with you all. So today we're going to talk with Rabbi Geffen again about her experience that was I would say sort of a spiritual transformative experience and you probably have a lot of those given this is what you do but I think it it sounded like in listening to it, it really made you rethink how you thought about faith and things happening for a reason. So can you, and I, and I think people tend genera- generally have like a kind of like a Ugh, response when people say, mm-hmm. oh, well, things happen for a reason mm-hmm. because it's usually in response to bad things mm-hmm. and usually it feels unfair. Mm-hmm. And to say, oh, well, that happened for a reason feels, can feel dismissive and mm-hmm. hurtful. Mm-hmm. Um, but can you kind of speak to your experience, speak a little bit about faith? Because mm-hmm. I know you talk about faith. You talked about faith in this sermon mm-hmm. and how you understood it and how that may have mm-hmm. shifted a little bit mm-hmm. for you throughout this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, this idea of faith. Um And in Judaism, faith can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, In in any context, I'll just speak to the Jewish one. Faith could mean, um, you know, belief, right? And and sort of, I guess it implies maybe like a belief in God or something beyond us. Um, Faith could also mean like something more reminiscent of of hope, right? Like um, the idea that I have faith that everything will turn out all right, Mm -hmm. no matter what it is like trust that trust you know i often talk about there's a definition of of hope which i think um which resonates for me personally deeply um and it's the previous prime minister of the czech republic his name was vaclav havel he um he said something along the lines of you know hope isn't the understanding that that everything will turn out the way we want it to be Hope is the understanding that whatever, however it is that it turns out, it's worth our efforts and Mm. our best efforts to make it so, regardless of what happens in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that idea of hope or faith Mm -hmm. um, to me is really resonant. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say like, it's the belief that I will be okay. Yeah. In some, like that I will be able to handle or deal with whatever comes my way. Yeah. And I love that. And I, I would just, I, I would sort of say like, yeah, that idea that everything will be okay. Even if we aren't okay, it will be okay. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's the idea that everything has like a silver lining mm-hmm. or everything will be beautiful in the end. Right. Right. Sometimes things don't fall out that way. Life takes its courses in different ways. Um, but we'll be able to navigate whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. My daughter and I watched the new Frozen movie last night. And I think actually it did a beautiful, beautiful job about, um, capturing a person in, in a very dark moment. And the song is I'll do the next best thing, Mm -hmm. um, which is just the idea that even if you can't see any light, you can still do the next best thing, Mm -hmm. whatever the next thing is, whatever the next best thing is to be done. That's what we can do. Mm -hmm. And you know, the idea of being, hopefully it leads us on a path where we do start to see light or things do work out for the good right. or more for the good than the bad. Right. Um, but we always have, if we're living, if we're breathing, we have the ability to choose to take a step forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's faith, right? Like the idea that like I can take a step forward regardless of, 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 of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's some kind of built in trust, whether that's in God and the universe and the self, there has to be some kind of embedded trust in that in right. order to make that motivation 
there. Right. Right. Um, so what was your experience? So my experience was crazy. So, mm -hmm. and it's still like, it's now been a number of months and I, I think about this all the time. So, um, it was the day after Yom Kippur, which, so Yom Kippur in the Jewish world is probably the, you know, the most intense spiritual day for any Jewish person, but for clergy people, it's super intense. And it's, it's, it marks kind of like the closing of a really intense, almost two week period of time mm -hmm. that, that began with a holiday, a Jewish new year called Rosh Hashanah. And then there's a lot of stuff that happens in between and it all culminates on Yom Kippur. So the day after Yom Kippur is, is like a very um, happy, good kind of self-focused day for clergy people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had made an appointment for a massage that mm -hmm. day. I, 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 you know, like you can often find like random rabbis or cantors like at the movies or just, just, doing nothing mm -hmm. of any spiritual significance, mm -hmm. really. Not well, that there's but, anything wrong with a but movie. But taking or, care of yourself yeah, has self, a lot of spiritual sure, significance. For sure, self-care, right? But right. so it wouldn't be a day we would consider like a, a particularly mindful day for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was on my way driving um, to, um, to my massage and I was going down a road in one direction and another car was coming in the other direction and pulled into the left turn lane to turn left, what would be across my lane to get into the shopping center that was to, to my right. And anyway, just as I approached that intersection, I had a green light, but they, they like suddenly sort of gunned this turn and, and shot out in front of me. Um, and, and there was no way that the cars weren't going to collide. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, there are these moments where like, you know, something traumatic is about to happen. And although like time doesn't stop or slow down, you can, for some reason, my experience in these moments is that it does, like all of a sudden it expands and mm -hmm. there's time to think about a lot of different things. Right. So I get all these thoughts in my head about, you know, oh my God, we're gonna crash. I hope nobody's hurt, you know, um, I don't even know who's in her car, what, where our cars hit, you know, what's going to happen. It was mm -hmm. very frightening. And also sort of, I would imagine like the selfish human part of you that's like, oh, and yes, this exactly. was my day yes, for me. Exactly. And, and I at can't. the end, exactly. And it literally at the end of that like thought process, right before the impact happened, I was like, and man, I'm going to like not get to this massage. And I was like very put out and angry right. about it. Right. And that was like the last feeling that I had mm -hmm. in my head before this impact wasn't like one of like the most glorious <laughs> moments. <laughs> so, But we're all human. Yes, we're all human. So they say. So, um, and it, it ended up being a pretty significant impact and accident. Our cars were really like beat up, um, pretty damaged. Uh, but we were able to kind of like drive, like move them, drive them to the side of the road. And then the other driver got out of the car that she was in and I was able to get out of mine. So it was clear that neither of us was hurt in a way that we would need to go to a hospital or something mm -hmm. like that. So I got out of the car, she got out of hers and I, I asked her, I was like, are you okay? And she responded to me kind of like put out um, and in an angry kind of voice where she said something like, well, I guess I will be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and she said it like fast and irritated. Mm -hmm. um, and she had like a straight, like her eyes looked strange. They just, they, they were like wide and it just, it was something I noticed. Mm -hmm. I guess I assumed at the time she was angry or what, you know, um, irritated, put out, but then she never like asked me how I was. And so I sort of, I was, and I was certainly like irritated at this mm -hmm. point. So I was like, well, I'm fine too. And got back, walked, started to walk back into my car. Um, and as I was, you know, walked back um, toward the door, I turned to her and I was like, you know, we're going to have to call the police. It had been a big accident. And she was like, I know, I know. And she, just same tone and kind of she got back in her car um, and I got back in mine and I called 911 and took some time to get the police there. So it gave like a pretty extended period of time just to kind of think about what's <laughs> what happened, what's going to happen. And I was sitting there just, you know, kind of brooding, brooding mm -hmm. about 
how annoyed and irritated I was and what nerve this person had mm -hmm. to be irritated. It was her, sh she caused this accident, not mm -hmm. me. I had the right of way. Mm -hmm. um, and had sort of, been, and I'm just, you know, telling myself all these narratives of, mm -hmm. that are just all about how like righteous I am and how awful this other person is. And and I think an important part of this story is she's an African-American yes, woman exactly. in a very, in a predominantly white Yes. Suburb of Chicago. Yeah, and so. not just that. Her car was like an old beat up car already. So the, the community where this happened in is a, is a community where by and large everything looks um, kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. Grasses are, grasses and lawns are manicured and landscaped. People right. drive fancy cars. You don't typically see like a old beat up car and it is not the most diverse community in any way shape or form and certainly not racially diverse mm -hmm. um and so that really is where so you know i'm thinking this to myself all about how put out i am and then i start also thinking to myself right around the same time because it's the day after yom kippur and right like the high the jewish high holidays are all about like being forgiving, not being judgmental, not judging other people because who are we to judge? You know, God is the judge, not us. That kind of idea. And mm -hmm. like, I literally preach this all the, all the time. Right. Um, and then I started thinking to myself, like, wow, you know, like this this idea of being like aware of ourselves and and our own self righteousness. It's so much easier to put that in check during the high holidays mm -hmm. than it is after them. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and it had just been, it hadn't even been 24 hours. And that, right? and that period, I was listening to this, your sermon again with my daughter last night. And when you said it in the sermon, yeah. she laughed. And I wasn't sure if she knew what that meant. And yeah. I turned to her, she was just bat mitzvah. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> do you understand what she means? And she goes, yeah. She's like, the year from Yom Kippur to Rosh Hashanah is a lot longer exactly. than the short period of exactly. time from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Before. Exactly. And it was really like, you know, I mean, I always I think I'd like to think that I always am preaching to everyone, including myself. I don't think that I'm better than anybody else or above any message that mm -hmm. anyone might have to offer, including mm -hmm. a message that I might have to offer. So like the benefit of that is that like it's readily in my mind, this stuff. And then I realized I was like, oh, my God, I'm being so self-righteous. Like maybe something else is happening here in this moment and then i started to think about what was actually happening which was okay so here is this woman who i don't know why she's here but she, you know she doesn't fit here um and her eyes were so wide and strange what i assumed had been irritation you know maybe it was fear mm -hmm. right and her her quick paced voice her kind of bugged out eyes her kind of frazzled nature. Mm -hmm. Maybe that wasn't that she was put out. Maybe she was frightened at what had happened or what maybe she thought was going to happen now. Um, well, and I, what we were talking about before I started recording and I would encourage you all who are listening to think about is to stop for a minute and think about your assumptions yeah. in this situation because right. we all have them. Right. And I know that this show isn't necessarily about that, but it is about how we can live more meaningful lives. And I think part of how we get caught in not living meaningful lives is making assumptions about people when we don't know exactly. what their stories are. Well, and then I would also say like one of the luxuries of what ended up happening was I had this time to reflect mm -hmm. um, and I feel like when we when we're dealing with implicit bias or whatever it is the assumptions we make about anything often we have to create time right. to process okay let me think to myself what are my assumptions in this case but what is actually going on do they mm -hmm. align do they not I had this it was probably 20 minutes before the police arrived so it was a lot of time to kind of think about it and I'm so grateful for that so then maybe 10 minutes into this period of time, this woman gets out of her car, comes over to my car and is like, can you help me find my hazard lights? I don't know where they are. And the whole kind of encounter, I, I don't want to say it was sweet, but she, her, her, demeanor, her way of being, her right. demeanor, kind of her approach, it changed. Um, so I went to her car and, and I was glad we were able to have some kind of like helping experience. And so, you know, but she didn't know where her hazard lights were which was another kind of now that I reflect back on it mm -hmm. kind of kind of clue in this in this encounter. Mm -hmm. um, the police come 
Um, the officer comes to my car, gets my driver's license, my insurance, all that stuff, goes to the other car, um, then goes back to her car, the police car, to, I guess, I assume, put in the information. She then comes back to my car and says, you know, here's your license, here's your insurance, what have you. I want to let you know that the other driver um, does not have a license or insurance um, and that you need to leave now. You should go. Um, to me. And so I, I, I said to her, um, I think she might be scared, the other driver. And the officer was like, I bet she is. And you should probably go. Um, which I assumed meant she was going to have to arrest her. And so at that point in time, um, you know, now, because I have a different story in my head, I become very worried about what's gonna happen to this woman. You know, the sort of two scenarios in my head were, the least bad one was, she's gonna get arrested, and then she's gonna have a record, and I know about what criminal records do mm -hmm. in the community, in particular in an African-American community. I, it doesn't look like this person has resources to get herself out of jail or get an attorney, I don't know, but, that's a really bad story that unfolds and that's the least bad one. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other story is, I don't know where she's from. Maybe she's not from our country. And then I was like, oh my God, she's gonna get deported. Mm -hmm. um, and that was terrifying, mm -hmm. right? But the police officer told me to go and I didn't know what to do. And then, so I left, I drove whatever, my car was like, we were a half a mile from the body shop. So I sort of tootled along on the road and just was kind of processing all this stuff and got to the body shop and just kind of burst into tears when I got in there because I was like, oh my God, you know, this person's life is now ruined. Um, and I don't know what I can do about any of it because it's now in this police officer's hand. My husband came to pick me up and he was trying to, you know, trying to be helpful about, I, there's nothing you can do about this, um, and or suggesting things that we could do, and none of them were really realistic. Mm -hmm. And then I was just very upset and worried. And, and kind of at that point, you know, you talk about like faith and hope. I did not really have any, and I was pretty despondent. You know, I went home and talked to my kids about what had happened, and we all just were very upset and trying to think about what we could do the next day, because at this point, it's now night, mm -hmm. um, to, to go find this woman in the jail, in the community. <laughs> you know, what, what were we going to do? Right. So what's fr what started as this experience of just anger and frustration it, turns into, like, how can I help this person? Yeah, but also, for, it got so much worse like than just ang like it became a real feeling of like despondency mm -hmm. of of for you yeah for me mm -hmm. that was my experience mm -hmm. in it and and that's sort of how that evening ended um and then the next morning my cell phone rang like really early um with a number i didn't recognize and so when i answered it it was the officer from the day before who her name um is officer maldonado and she, she was like, hi, it's Officer Maldonado. I just wanted to call you to let you know how everything unfolded yesterday after you left because it seemed like you were upset. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you so much for calling me. Is the woman OK? Right. Like, where is she? Is she OK? Um, and the officer was like, yes, she's totally fine. That's why I'm calling you. Um, and she told me the woman's name is Eleanor. And then she was like, I, I want to tell you a story about what happened. She kind of like paused in her in her talking to tell me that. Um, and so I was like, OK, you know, tell me what happened. And so she said after I had left, she went back to her car, the, to the police car, to like try to find some contact information for this person, the driver, because the driver didn't know anything as it turned out. She didn't know really her name. She didn't know anything about herself. And the so the the police officer looks up the, I assume it was the license plate of the car. Somehow that gets her to a contact number. So she calls a number and the person who answers the phone um, turns out to be the daughter of Eleanor. Um, and the they relay to the police officer that Eleanor has been missing for an extended mm -hmm. period of time. They're from the south side of Chicago. Um, they didn't know what had happened to her because she has dementia. So she had like taken the car and disappeared. She doesn't have a cell phone. She didn't take any of her stuff. They, they just had no clue what had happened to her. They had been like saving up money to um, get billboards like on the highway for a missing oh. person. 
because they just didn't know they had reported it, I guess, to the police. But like there was no there was no reason for her to be on the North Shore. Right. Like There's no just no, no connection. connection. I think they assumed she would have been in whatever local communities to her. And we're nowhere near that. So it just hadn't there was no information about it, basically. Right. So Officer Maldonado was like why don't you come up and, you know, come get your mom. I'll stay with her. And so the officer sat with her, sat with Eleanor in her car for like the two and a half hours that it took for them to get up. Cause it was like the early evening. So they had to drive through rush hour traffic mm-hmm. in the South side of Chicago is just nowhere near the, the North shore. Right. Um, so the family came up, they got her. Um, and she, as it turned out, she, this is something that wasn't in the sermon. She did have a license and she did have insurance. She just didn't know she did. Oh. Um, and they brought her home and she was safe and most importantly, alive. Right. Right. Which they thought they had lost. They her. thought they had lost. I mean, they just, they had no clue what had happened to her. They assumed she, she must be gone. Like mm-hmm. they, you know, they didn't, they just didn't know. And they feared she was dead. So, so then the police officer says to me, you know, um, I don't know what you believe about these things. And I was like, well, you know, I sort of, she didn't know who I was, like what I did for a living or anything. And I was like, well, I, you know, like I'm a clergy person, I'm a rabbi. So like, I could probably go with you along this line of thinking or whatever. And she was like, okay, good. She said, well. As opposed to just believing you got in an accident. Exactly. Exactly. She was trying to like, you know, bring some wisdom, um, which I thought was amazing. Um, And then she was like, you know, I think this happened for a reason. I think like you were in the car for a reason. It was you for a reason. And like everything Mm -hmm. that unfolded um, happened because like it was put there to be that way, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And then she said, you know, and if this hadn't happened this way, think about what could have happened to Eleanor, right? Like what would have then happened? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this experience changed the trajectory of that story, which could have gone in any number of other ways, right? And think of how many people the ripple effect. Oh my god! For yeah, that I mean, it was just very powerful. Um, you know, and I would say the same. I think all the more so that Officer Maldonado was the one who came and you know made the decision not to instinctually react, but to seek out a contact number, try to figure out what else was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she really, in my mind. Um, she was really the one who kind of like changed the mm-hmm. story mm-hmm. Um, because of her thoughts, her actions, what she did, which I don't know. Maybe that's always what she would have done. Right. You know, um, but she did it nevertheless. And she obviously thought there was something in you that gave her pause to think about maybe I, I need to yeah. maybe rethink that. Yeah. I get, you know, I, these are the things, these are the things that, you know, all of these things happen in these sequences and they allow different different narratives to unfold. Mm-hmm. So I think probably we everything that happened led to that mm-hmm. for her, mm-hmm. right? So it's, for those people that would say, oh, this was just a coincidence. Right, yeah. I mean, look, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know that anyone can ever say for sure, like, oh, well, I was put there, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't... I, I don't know. I mean, I think we could choose to believe that we were put there or not. Either way, um, whether it just happened or whether we were put in a position to be messengers, the truth of the matter is we're always in the position to be messengers. Mm -hmm. You know, like if anything, that's, I guess, my my what I was reminded about um, is that we always have the opportunity to see something more expansively to get out of our instinct to to be less judgmental to see a larger story mm-hmm. um and, and to, to see ourselves in yes, anybody else's story yes and there and right because that's what opens the door to empathy mm-hmm. right instead of judgment which is really the place that i think most people live in most of the time, mm-hmm. kind of our default subconscious, mm-hmm. you know, is a place of protection of ourselves, defensiveness. Um, and, you know, I don't, I guess that has its function in some way, shape or form, but our, our higher callings, you know, they're, they're available to us all the time. And if we mm-hmm. think of ourselves, I would say to the cynic, I would say, okay, so fine. Don't think you were put there. Think of yourself as always there, you know, mm. um, Fine, there is no God, 
Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to put you anywhere. So nobody's here to help anything but you, right? All the more so what I say. Right. Put yourself there then. Make yourself a messenger, <laughs> right? Like, and what kind of framing would that provide for us mm-hmm. as humans in mm-hmm. the world? It doesn't, you know, whether you have a religious faith or no faith at all, I think all of us kind of are bonded together with a yearning for good, not bad, right? Like for the betterment of our communities, um, not not so people suffer, but so that they do better. Mm-hmm. I like to think that way. Mm-hmm. And if we think of ourselves that way, you know, then it really can be that we are aware um, in this heightened state of the larger story of which we're totally a part of all the time. Right. You know, it works the other way too. Like so much of the time we abnegate ourselves of our agency in any given story. Well, who am I to, you know, do X, Y, Z? I'm nobody. I don't count for anything. So Mm -hmm. I'll just let whatever is unfolding around me unfold, but it has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. I don't allow myself to emotionally connect to it. And I think that's really a symptom of the same lack of quote unquote faith. There's something really powerful about what would happen if we see ourselves that way all the time, if we see ourselves always as potentially in a position to change the story for the better. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and always in the position of maybe everything does happen for a reason, right? right? Like it shifts how you view that statement. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that gives me faith in the possibility that everything really can be for the good or Mm -hmm. more for the good than for the bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that anything works in total absolutes. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it really just for me brought to bear um, that tension between like everything can change in an instant. And there's not like, you know, there's a lot that we can't control in our lives. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, everything can change in an instant. And that should remind us that we have some capability, some destiny, depending on how you understand it, um, in any moment Mm -hmm. to to be a messenger, I'd like to think for the good. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you, stepping out of like the rabbi mm -hmm, role mm -hmm. in that moment, Mm -hmm. or as the story unfolded, feel like maybe you were? For like, sure. It did I mean, feel like something yeah, bigger. You know, as soon as the, as soon as the, I felt like the police officer was like my rabbi in that moment, you know, like, she, you know, she was dropping like this, this faith message onto me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, for me, I really feel like she was the messenger. Like I would relay the story, the same story that she told me just to her in the frame, mm-hmm. right? Like I would mm-hmm. say, I think you were the police officer for the reason. I think you made the phone call for a reason. Like right. all of those things unfolded for the reason. I felt like I was just a kind of one part of this larger story, but mm-hmm. it definitely felt as though things had unfolded the way they did and some sort, something larger was at play, mm-hmm. right? And that doesn't happen to me every day at all. So, and you're in the business. Yes, exactly. Of, and that is my business. I right. mean, I witness and I'm a part of a lot of amazing things all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but not so um, dramatically and personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm often witness to it, not participant in, in it. it. Right. So it just, it was very impactful. Um, and something that I'm still thinking about and mm-hmm. that my family is still talking about. And then I know other people who've who've seen this story in this sermon have have remarked in the same regard. And it just, you know, I think I think some things we won't ever know for sure. But I'd like to think there's the possibility, mm-hmm. you know, that I was there for that reason that day, um, that the that Officer Maldonado was there for that reason that day. Right. Um, and that day it worked out that a person's, you know, life was saved mm-hmm. um, in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Well, it's such a beautiful story, and yeah. I'm grateful that you shared it with me Thank today. Thank you for asking me to share it. And I will link to, because I'm sure maybe people will want to reach sure. out, so I will link in my show notes, but can you tell people, if you want them to find you, where they can find sure. you? Sure. So you can just go to our synagogue website, which is www.nsci.org like North Shore Congregation Israel, and anyone can get to me through the website. 
Well, thank you so much for your time for both episodes, which were phenomenal for your wisdom always, for always getting me and I'm sure this entire congregation to think about things differently and to shift the way that they are in this world. So thank you. Right back at you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Curious about what comes next and what it all means? You can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life death and the space between and hit subscribe and you can follow me on twitter and instagram at dr amy robbins ask me any questions you might have let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story i can't wait to hear from you